pray with me? Father, how can this be that once your enemies, now your friends? Lord, that's just overwhelming to think about. Haters of God, we once were hostile in our mind, eager to move you out of the way and put our own sin before us. Weak towards you, but powerful ourselves towards sin. And now everything has changed because of Jesus, because of his death in our place, because of his shed blood for us, because of justification by faith alone, because of being reconciled to you. Father, as we stand and look back, we marvel at where we are now. Father, turn us this morning even with your word and and help us to also see what the future holds for us in light of what you have done for us in the past, in light of where we are now. And give us hope. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Let's take our Bibles this morning and open up to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 11 is where we are. That's where we're going to pick back up this morning. And I want to start by reading our passage. We've already spent one Sunday on Romans 5, 1 to 11. We've covered the first five verses. So we'll, we'll review a little bit, and then we'll cover verses 6 to 11. Let me read Romans 5, verses 1 to 11 for us this morning. Paul says, Therefore, having been justified by faith... We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. And we exult in hope of the glory of God. And not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations, knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance and perseverance, proven character and proven character, hope. And hope does not disappoint because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. For while we were still helpless, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Romans chapter 5, verse 1 begins with a very familiar and a very important statement. If you've been with us in our study of Romans, you know that it's familiar, you know that it's an important statement. It's this one, therefore, having been justified by faith. And the reason that's familiar is because that is what Romans 3, verse 21, all the way through the end of chapter 4, has put forward over and over and over and over again. The only way for a sinner like me or like you to gain a righteous status before God that he'll accept is through faith alone in Jesus alone. And now, in Romans chapter 5, verse 1, that familiar statement that is really at the heart of the gospel It functions something like a bridge that connects two huge land masses of truth to one another. (coughs) Excuse me. As a bridge statement, it connects us obviously back to the prior section on justification by faith alone, in Christ alone. It assumes all of that truth about justification that Paul just laid out for us in those prior chapters, those truths are not going to be put forward again over and over and over like they already have been. The reader is expected now to continue just to hang on to those important justification truths that have been spelled out. But as a bridge statement, 
therefore having been justified by faith, that statement makes us now ready to move on to a new landmass of truth to help us see what comes over the bridge with justification by faith alone, what benefits come with it to us in this new life that we now have in Christ. You see, God's grace came to us, justified us apart from any works that we did. That's Romans 3.21. But that same grace on that side of the huge chasm between us and God is also the same grace that comes across and gives us every single other salvation benefit we need in Christ. And really, Romans 5, 6, 7, and 8, those chapters are the treasure trove of grace benefits, or the benefits that accompany justification by faith alone. And the very first benefit associated with justification by faith alone is worship, the worship of God. Three times in verses 1 to 11, we find a really, really strong verb, we exult. We exult, verse 2, at the end, and we exult in hope of the glory of God, verse 3, and not only this, we also exult in our tribulations, verse 11 at the end, I'm sorry, verse 12, no, verse 11, where is it? There it is. And not only this, but we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That verb means to boast in God. It's a really strong word. It means to be jubilant in triumphant rejoicing. Uh, The way that the description I like the best or the definition I like the best is this one. A worshipful expression of overwhelming joy. That's what it means to exult in God. There's nothing bland about that. There's nothing plain about that. There's nothing ho-hum about that word, about that kind of worship of God. The point that the gospel is putting forward is that the one justified by faith alone is one who is caught up with the overwhelming greatness and glory of God in Jesus Christ. That's the point. How could he save us? And we come across into a new life and yawn about who he is. Are you a believer? Are you a believer in Jesus Christ? Then you are marked by this boasting in Jesus Christ. And so we're breaking down these 11 verses by the three boasting or exulting statements. So the big idea here in the verses 1 to 11 is exulting or boasting in the God who justified us. We are now enabled by grace to be worshipers. It's amazing. We used to hate him. You used to hate God. And you loved yourself supremely. Now, you're a worshiper of him because you've been justified by faith. And so to get us to that worshipful expression of overwhelming joy in God, justification has three catalysts to help us get there. We've covered the first two already. So let's briefly review them before we examine thoroughly the last one. So the first catalyst that compels those justified by faith to boast in God is, number one, peace with God. Remember? Verses 1 and 2. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God. That's the first main statement. The second main clause that goes with it is the one at the end of verse 2. And we exult in hope of the glory of God. So we have peace with God, and we worshipfully express overwhelming joy in hope, in confident expectation that one day we'll see the glory of God. So peace is a catalyst. Peace with God is the first catalyst that gets us to a worshipful expression of overwhelming joy in God. And everything between those two main clauses in verses 1 and 2 is descriptive about the peace that we have with God, and it shows us how peace with God compels us as justified ones to boast in God our Savior. Verse 2 expands on this amazing peace. Look at it. Through whom also we have obtained our introduction by faith into this grace in which we stand. What that does is that tells us what God has done in in, what kind of peace this is. It tells us about the kind of relationship that he wants to have with us. God wants a relationship with us in his peace that's marked by access to his grace. So get this, God acquitted us 
God pardoned us for sure. He gave to us his own righteousness through faith in Jesus Christ. He did that, but then he didn't keep us at arm's length and say, yeah, but just kind of give me some space. He doesn't do that. What verse 2 says is that we have the door to God's grace thrown wide open before us. And we have the invitation continually extended to us to come and to gain access to God's enthroned grace. God wants those who have believed him to come near and to enter into deeper apprehensions, deeper comprehensions of his grace in which we now stand firmly. That's an amazing piece that we have with God. So peace with God acts like a catalyst that leads us to worshipfully express overwhelming joy in confident expectation that one day we will see the radiant, impressive, weighty, overwhelming glory of God. That is what we long for. We exchange the glory of God for, for empty images. Before, that's what we did. We didn't want anything about his weightiness, his impressiveness, his splendor. But we've been changed. And we long to see it. We have this confident expectation that we will see the God of glory. What an amazing benefit for us. We, from those who hated God to those who boast in him. Having been justified by faith, we have become overwhelmingly uh, joyful worshipers of the God who saved us. But then Paul shocks us with the second catalyst. Do you remember? The second catalyst that compels those justified by faith to boast in God is number two, tribulations in life. Verse three, and not only this, but we also exult in our tribulations? Do you see what Paul did there? Paul so easily substituted out hope. He substituted out confident expectation with our tribulations, as if they're the same thing, as if they can almost accomplish the same thing. How can this be? I mean, we get the first statement, I want to exult in hope of the glory of God. I get that. I don't want to exult in my tribulations, and neither do you. How can this be? The only way we would be able to similarly boast in our tribulations in life, like we boast in confident expectation of one day seeing the glory of God is if our tribulations somehow get us to that same hope, and that is exactly the point in verse three. And not only this, but we exult in our tribulations knowing this. We know this about the tribulation design of God. Knowing that tribulation brings about perseverance and perseverance brings about proven character and proven character brings about what? That same hope, that same confident expectation. And that hope will not disappoint us. That hope will not disgrace us as we come through difficult trials. Why? Verse 5, because the love of God has been poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who was given to us. We will not be disappointed in this hope because all throughout the tribulations that we experienced as believers in Jesus Christ in this world that hates us, throughout all of the sweating and throughout all of the perseverance, throughout all of the growth in maturity of having our character be refined over and over and over. God, throughout all of that, is lavishing his love for you, believer, on you, believer, in your heart, through the Holy Spirit that he gave to you. And your confident expectation in all of that is trained. It is focused like a laser beam on that glory of God that you hope to see someday. Your tribulation didn't destroy your hope, and your tribulations will not destroy your worship of God. Tribulations from God in this life will refine your hope, will deepen your worship of him. Biblical hope is completely unlike worldly hope. Some of you said, I hope the Yankees make it to the World Series. Worldly hope is laced with doubt. It just is. And so when an unbeliever thinks of 
hope and tribulations, if they ever think of them in the same sentence, if they ever use those two words in the same sentence, what they say is something like this, I hope tribulations never come. But the believer who knows God's design for tribulations, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ and you know what God does with tribulations, you put hope and tribulation together in the same sentence this kind of way. Tribulations help me hope in God. They do. I'm not crazy about it all the time, but that's the truth. That's what happens. So peace with God is a catalyst compelling those justified by faith to boast in God. But so also are our tribulations. They are a catalyst compelling us to boast in God. Now let's consider this morning the third and the final catalyst that compels the justified believer to worshipfully express overwhelming joy in God. The third catalyst, number three, is reconciliation through Christ. Paul mentioned God's love in verse five. God himself, the Holy Spirit, is the one who wants to make sure that your experience of God's love um, is what you get in overwhelming shape and form. He lavishes God's love for you, on you, in you. He doesn't leak it on you with a slow drip. And now for the next three verses, six, seven, and eight, Paul is going to advance on God's love for the believer. And it is a love for us that came to us when we were at our worst. Here's the main clause in verse 6 that advances on God's love. Christ died for the ungodly. That's the main clause. The death of Jesus Christ is the proof of God's love for us. And it is a shocking love. It's a unique love. And it is a costly love because Christ died. He emptied out his life to express the love that God has for us. And notice this, Christ died for the ungodly. That's the language of substitution. He died in the place of the ungodly ones like us. I should have died. You should have died, believer. But Christ died for us in the place of us. So God's love in Christ's death was for the ungodly, meaning the, the totally unrighteous. And now that sounds very similar to Romans chapter 4, verse 5. Just look back maybe a page in your Bible. But to the one who does not work but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. Look at that amazing statement. He justifies the ungodly. God is the one who declares the ungodly righteous through faith. Remember, God doesn't declare... The one who's reforming himself, he doesn't declare that one righteous. God doesn't declare righteous the one who's trying to reinvent himself. Rather, the grace of God in the gospel just comes and says, I know you're ungodly. In your ungodliness, believe my son. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is credited as righteousness. And similarly, in chapter 5, verse 6, Christ did not die for the one who is trying to reform his life or trying to re reinvent her life. He didn't even die because he said, you know what, I can see that some potential is going to come, so I'm going to go ahead and, and I'll go ahead and die now because I can see some potential coming. He died for the ungodly. Nothing you tried to do morally moved him to die for you. Christ's death for the ungodly occurred, look at verse 6, while we were still helpless. That word helpless needs to be properly understood. It means spiritually weak, morally weak. It's not a physical weakness. It is morally, spiritually powerless. It is morally, spiritual, incapable of changing. We were helpless to change our hatred of God, Romans 1.30. We were helpless to stop suppressing the truth of God. We were helpless to overcome our sin. We were helpless to change God's wrath against us. We were helpless to bring ourselves to God. We were helpless in every way possible toward God. We were powerful in every way towards our sin. No helplessness there. There. 
complete helplessness towards God. And so notice this list of descriptions that is beginning, describing us. To be helpless, verse 6, is to be ungodly. Two blunt descriptions of what we once were. And while we were helpless, and while we were ungodly, Christ died in our place. But notice also Christ died for the ungodly, verse 6, at the right time. There should be no doubt in your mind about the timing of what God did at the cross. Christ's death for ungodly ones didn't arrive too early. God didn't panic and go, oh, I'll hit the button now. And he also wasn't late to the game. It happened exactly when it was supposed to happen. At the proper time, he died for the ungodly. So being what we were helpless, being what we were as ungodly, that's the right time for a substitute to die. And Paul now contrasts God's love with the extent of man's love. Verse 7, for one will hardly die for a righteous man. So among men, among mankind, it is a rare, unusual, infrequent, scarce thing to see one man die for somebody else. Someone else even marked by righteous conduct. Paul continues, verse 7, though perhaps for the good man someone would, someone would dare even to die. That second willingness to die is really no more certain than the first willingness to die. It's no more dependable, it's no more frequent, perhaps. Someone would dare even to die. And that rare, scarce, infrequent uncertain, unusual willingness to die will only occur for someone when it does occur who's worthy, righteous, or good by our estimation. What's the point? Here's the point. When it comes to sacrificing ourselves for another, we humans look for any other possible solution first. That's what we do. And even then, when we choose to do the unusual, die for somebody else, we look for ones worthy of it, righteous, good. We, when we absolutely have to, we might, perhaps, we might die for one worthy of the sacrifice. We're looking for the motive outside of us in them. And if God loved us like that, he would have never sent his son in the first place. What God, in contrast, did is completely unexpected. It's completely unheard of. The way that he loved us does not exist among men. God's love in Christ's death for us goes immeasurably beyond the reaches of human love and sacrifice, verse 8. But God demonstrates his own love. Listen, that's the contrast. He doesn't say that God demonstrates the common way that we all love, including God. He doesn't lump God's love in with ours. No, but God, in contrast, loves us with his own love in a completely different way. He demonstrates it for us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And Christ's death for us, which is the ultimate expression of, of God's love, for us found absolutely no motive in you or in me to come about because it was while we were yet sinners verse 8 while we were yet sinners and that's the third description of us in this growing list being sinners that means we were wholly given up to and over to our sin. We aimed to live in our sin. We aimed to please ourselves in our sin with anything sinful and everything sinful that is outside of God. It, it's the uh, classic idea of missing the mark. Let me give you an example of what it means to miss the mark because this can be really misunderstood. Like you're trying to hit the target, but you just miss. I missed the mark. That's not what's going on here. Let me show you in Romans chapter 1, verse 23, what it means to miss the mark. Turn back with me. 
Romans 1, verse 23. We exchanged the glory of the incorruptible God for an image in the form of corruptible man. That's missing the mark. God, in all of his weightiness, in all of his overwhelming impressiveness, incorruptible God, instead of aiming for him, we said, I'd like to exchange that for a scribbling in my mind of an image or a form of man. That's exchanging and missing the mark. Look at verse 25 of Romans 1. They exchange the truth of God for a lie. That's missing the mark. That's the kind of, that's what sin means. It is to miss the mark that way. Instead of aiming for the truth concerning God, I chose instead to aim for the lie, any lie. That's missing the mark. And while we were like that, Christ died. God demonstrates his love for us through that 2,000-year-old sacrifice. What does that tell us about where the motive lay for God's love? Not in you and not in me. Because we were sinners. Because we were not righteous. We were not good. The motive to die for us must have been located where? In him. In him. That's his own love. He loves completely unlike us. Now, I don't know if you've noticed where the gospel has been directing us to look, but we've been looking back at the event of Christ's death at the cross for us. Now, notice how Paul starts moving us forward in time quickly in verse 9. Much more than having now been justified by his blood. Much more than means that there's more to add on to what has already been said about God's love, about Christ's death for us, for helpless and godly sinners like us. And what must be added to that first is that which is true in the now. Verse 9, much more than having now been justified by his blood. Do you see how our present justification, believers, is in connection with Christ's bloody death long ago? at the cross. The bottom line is Christ's bloody death in the past is what our current justification is inseparably connected with. We have it now in connection with his bloody death. But Paul wants to take us even forward further in time. Look at the main statement in verse 9. We shall be saved. Future tense from the wrath of God through him. Future. God has wrath that is coming in the future. And through Christ, we will be saved from that coming wrath. So get this. He's been turning around, making us look at the past. In the past, Jesus died. And the shedding of his blood propitiated God, satisfied his wrath against us. And then in the now, that bloody death in the past makes our justification possible through faith now. And in the future, he who died for us is the one who will save us from that wrath. It'll come through him. Jesus is everywhere in salvation, past, present, and future. Let me take you back to Romans chapter 2, verse 5, just to remind you about this wrath that has already been mentioned. Look at this. Romans chapter 2, verse 5. But because of your stubbornness and unrepentant heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath, in the day of revelation of the righteous judgment of God. He will render to each person according to his own deeds. Look at verse 8. To those who are selfishly ambitious and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, wrath and indignation for them. Verse 9, tribulation and distress for every soul of man who does evil. Doesn't matter if you're a Jew or Greek. Look down at verse 16. On the day when, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus. There is a day coming full of God's wrath. In verse 9 of chapter 5, turn back there with me, 
tells us that our justification has this other really wonderful benefit for us. That on the day of wrath, on that day when Jesus judges every man, for those who believe, well, having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. And here is the much more than point that's being made in verse 9. If while we were helpless, if while we were ungodly, if while we were yet sinners, his bloody death made our justification possible now, much more than will he save us from the wrath of God that's coming. If while we were sinners, he died for you and he died for me, Will he allow us to fall under the coming wrath of God? The answer is absolutely no. We shall be kept safe on that day through Jesus, having been justified by his blood. His bloody death. And verse 10 expands on this, on this much more reality for those who believe. It is, again, the argument from the, what is in the beginning more difficult to what is later less difficult. Look at verse 10. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Future tense. And it's a condition. Do you see that? If, at the beginning of verse 10, let's look at this condition for a moment that's laid out in verse 10. We were reconciled. That's the heart of the, of the condition if we were reconciled. To be reconciled is to exchange the hostility in a relationship for friendship in the relationship. It's the exchange of hostility for a friendly relationship. To be loved by God in Christ's death, that was verses 6, 7, and 8. To be loved by God in Christ Jesus is to be reconciled to God through Christ Jesus' death. God's love for us is our reconciliation. Jesus died. And this is a passive verb, meaning we were reconciled. It was done for us. It was done to us. We didn't do the reconciling of us to God. God exchanged the hostility in our relationship with him for a friendly relationship with him. And he did it through the death of his son. He did it at great cost to himself. Keep going with this condition. He did this, verse 10, while we were enemies. And we finally arrive at the last word of the worst of the, and the worst of the terms that describe us. Let's review them briefly for a moment. Verse 6, we were helpless. Lying powerless to change our rebellion against God. Which means we aimed for any other, and that means we could only remain ungodly verse 6, right? I mean, you can only remain ungodly if you can't change anything about you and you're already ungodly. Which means, verse 8, we aimed for any and every other possible pursuit in life except God. We missed the mark that is God in the worst way possible. We are sinners. And now verse 10, and while we are all of that, as his enemy, we hated God. And we invented evil against him, Romans 1.30. And we plotted evil against him, how we might kill God if he came close enough. If I could just get my hands around his heart. I would do to him what I've been doing to his truth. I'd suppress his truth. I'd, I'd kill him. That's the language. Enemies. Enemies. Me. You. You. And while we were all of that, his love for us was expressed in his son's death in our place to exchange the hostility out for friendship with him. How hard would it be to do that? To plan to sacrifice your son in love for ones that you know hate him and want him dead. How hard would it have been to do that? Would you, let me ask you, would you lay down your life for someone who was always slandering you, always ruining your reputation, always planning and plotting to kill you if you came close enough? Would you die for that one? How about this? Would you you sacrifice your son for that one? 
You see, one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. While we were enemies, verse 10, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son. If that unheard of condition was met, that if, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, and indeed that was met, verse 10, much more, having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. If God did the hardest, dying to reconcile God-hating enemies like me and you to himself, if he did the hardest, he'll have no trouble saving you and me from his coming wrath. This is the much more than argument that's going on. Listen, the distance, the distance from enemy status that we once were to righteous status that we now have, the distance from our former enemy status to our friendship status with God is greater than the distance from our current righteousness status to being saved by his wrath, or being saved at his wrath through Christ. And it's not a distance measured by time. It's a distance of condition. The condition I was there to get from there to where I am now, that is massive. And he already did it. So to get me from righteousness now, so that when all he sees over me is a declaration of his own righteous status, when he sees me at judgment, he says, you're safe through my son. If God in Christ achieved the first, the second is guaranteed. And notice the contrast in verse 10 between Christ's death and his life that he now lives. Look at verse 10. If while we were reconciled, I'm sorry, if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, much more, having been reconciled, you might expect him to say this, we shall be saved through his death. But that's not what he says. What does he say? Well, we say through his life. So there's a contrast between what he did in dying to now that he's alive. By dying, Christ achieved our reconciliation. But now, get this, all he has to do to save us from the coming wrath of God is just keep living. Just keep living. He's alive. All he has to do is keep living his resurrected, ascended right hand of the throne of God life. That's all he's got to do is keep living. To choose to die for us, how hard would that have been? To choose to keep living for us. That seems a little easier. It is. So if he already did the most difficult, surely he will do what is less difficult for him. And he'll keep us from the wrath of God. Believer, why? Why do we tremble at times? Wondering about whether God will really see us through. Why do we tremble sometimes wondering if, if God will remain faithful to his promises to us? Why do we wonder if and tremble, will he sustain me through my tribulations? Why do we wonder if he'll sustain us through and on my deathbed? Why do we tremble wondering, really, no, no wrath for me at all? Are, are you, you, you going to keep that promise? The truth is, from God's perspective laid out here in Romans 5, 6 to 10, is this, that for the one justified by faith, there is no reason to tremble in uncertainty about God, about God's commitment to us. These are the statements of fact to be believed, to cling to. We shall be saved from the wrath of God. We shall be saved by his life. 
listen to this. If, if he reconciled his enemy to himself, will he not keep his friend to the end? That's the idea. If he reconciled his enemy to himself, will he not keep his friend all the way to the end? Do you realize, believer, that from God's perspective, we're, we're being given God's perspective in Romans 5. You have no reason to be uncertain about that coming day of wrath. It doesn't make you cocky. It makes you worship. You have no reason to be uncertain about his coming day of wrath. Your justification by faith that is in connection with Jesus' bloody death is your security for the day of wrath that's coming. The church has failed to talk about this coming wrath of God. And by church, I mean believers in general. We just don't talk about this. It's coming. God has appointed a day in which he will judge the world through a man. And the man that he did, he proved which man it is. It's the man he raised from the dead. Acts 17. It's coming. And that son of God will in all of his righteousness empty out his wrath on this earth. And for the one who is justified by faith, you're saved. You're saved through him. If he reconciled his enemy through his bloody death, he will preserve his friend and he will preserve his child all the way through his son, with his son's life. I came across this quote. I want to share it with you. It's really simple. And it describes me and it probably describes you. I often tremble on the rock. But the rock never trembles under me. I often tremble on the rock. But the rock never trembles under me. What an encouraging description to help put into words what it is that I need to think rightly about. I, I tremble, but the rock never trembles. I tremble wondering how God could keep us all the way to the end when, when I keep sinning against him. How, how can he do that? Here's God's certainty for his heartbroken disheartened, faint-hearted, anxious children. God could say to us and is saying to us through a passage like this, if I reconciled my enemy to me and made him my friend, I'll keep my friend to the end. By dying, my son reconciled you. By living at my right hand, he'll keep you safe all the way. He had to die to achieve the first of your salvation. Now all he has to do to finish it is keep living. That's all he's got to do. All right, so let me give you the four-step process, four-step process by which your salvation will ultimately falter and fail at the coming wrath of God. Okay, four-step process. I know you're a little shocked right now, but write these down. Number one, here's a four-step process of how your salvation will falter on the day of wrath. Number one. Ascend into heaven where Christ is, seated at the right hand of the Father. Write it down. Number one, that's what I have to do. I have to ascend into heaven to the right hand of the Father where the, the, where the Son is. Number two, step in between the Father and the Son to seize the Son, to get your hands on him. Number two, are you writing this down? Number three, drag the Son back down to the dust of the earth. Number three, drag him back down to the dust of the earth. And finally, number four, slay him. Take his resurrected, ascended life away from him. Do to him what the Roman soldiers could not do. Do for him what the grave could not do. Do to him what Pilate could not do to him. Do what the religious leadership of the temple could not do to him. And kill him and keep him dead. Because if you can do that, you will falter at the day of salvation because everything else he did for you prior to that counts for nothing. Sorry, I was trying to trick you a little bit. It's absolutely absurd. It's absolutely absurd. Just turn a couple pages to the right. Romans 8. 
32. He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all, how will he not also with him freely give us all things? Who? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus is he who died. Yes, rather, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who also intercedes for us. Undo that. You can't undo that. Who will separate us from the love of Christ? Will those tribulations, remember those, Romans 5? Or distress, or persecution, or famine, or nakedness, or peril, or sword? Just as it is written, for your sake we are being put to death all day long. We were considered as sheep to be slaughtered. But in all these things we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. For I am convinced that neither death nor life nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor any other created thing will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus, our Lord. Back to Romans 5, verse 11. Can you see the catalyst that this reconciliation through Christ is for boasting in Christ, boasting in God. Knowing this about Christ's death that reconciled us to God and knowing how secure we are in him by his ascended, resurrected life, aren't you compelled to express some joy in him? Verse 11, and not only this, we also exult in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received the reconciliation. Listen, we don't hope for reconciliation. We don't have a confident expectation for something we do not have, and that thing that we do not yet have is reconciliation. We don't hope for reconciliation. We have it. And in having it, we have everything else we need. And so... We worshipfully express overwhelming joy in our God who saved us. So you can see there's really no reason to tremble. Concerning God's commitment, we still will at times. But what's more important for you to see is that he's not trembling under the weight of you. There's no reason to tremble concerning God and his promises towards you. There's no reason to tremble. There's reason to worshipfully express overwhelming joy in him. And listen, trembling and boasting in God are very difficult things to coexist at the same time in your life. So when trembling comes, you now have your go-to passage. You come back to Romans 5, 1 to 11, and you just let those truths wash over your heart and your mind. You shepherd your heart to the word of God to see the God of the word and what he does for us. And what will happen is the catalysts that are connected to justification by faith will raise up your worship of him. And not a bland, ho-hum, boring worship, but you will find yourself becoming one who wants to worshipfully express an overwhelming joy in God. And as that happens and worship and boasting rises in your life, trembling will go away. And that's what you get to fight for every day for the rest of your life. In heaven, you won't have to fight for it anymore. One endless, worshipful expression of overwhelming joy in Jesus Christ. But today, you get to fight. That's what he saved you to. And that is a much better condition than what you were. As a helpless, ungodly, sinful enemy of God. Which kind of person are you today? Do those four words describe you? They describe every single one of us. Are you ready to accept that they describe you? 
helpless before God, ungodly before God, a sinner before God, actually his enemy. You can be changed through the death of Jesus Christ. Everything will change. Your past, acquitted, pardoned. Your present, you stand with a, a declaration of righteousness over you that God, every time he sees it, he rejoices in. That's my righteousness. You got it. I gave it to you. You didn't earn it. You trusted my son, and you got it. And your future, secure, because Christ lives to intercede for you. Has that happened for you yet today? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. How do we thank you enough? How do we thank you fervently enough? How do we find the right words to express to you this thankfulness and this joy that is in our hearts, Lord? We feel so numbed by our flesh and by our indwelling sin that our worship just seems so flat. Lord, would you as a, help us as a church to grow in this? Give us a heart for one another to help one another grow in this kind of worship of you. Help us to set these kinds of catalysts, these truths, these promises in front of us, in front of one another, that we might raise up a heart of worship for you. And not, not merely on Sunday mornings, Lord, but tomorrow at school tomorrow at work, tomorrow when the little ones are clawing at our knees. Father, help us. Grow us. Thank you for this benefit of, of worship, God. What, this makes total sense that in declaring us righteous on the basis of faith alone, that you would want us to be those who worshipfully express overwhelming joy in you. Forgive us for a worship that falls flat of that. And raise up in us these truths. Strengthen our grip on them so that we might worship you as you deserve. We ask it in Christ's name.